speak for very long. Uh, and I'm just going to suggest two big ideas to frame the conversations uh, that we're going to have today. And hopefully they will be able to help you think about the topics that we're going to discuss at this webinar that we developed in consultations with our partners, Ukrainian Startup Fund and Blue Lake Accelerator. The two big ideas are, first, we at Adam Smith has been closely monitoring the continued growth of the startup ecosystem in Ukraine and venture capital sector. We see many great cases emerging. However, sector still remains vastly undervalued and it's disconnected from the wider European tech startup ecosystem, which causes companies to look for capital elsewhere. So as investors search for uh, alternatives to overheated Silicon Valley, we think that Ukraine can provide this alternative given the number of talented people this country holds. All we need to do is to learn from successes of our European neighbors and implement the most successful practices locally to provide necessary tools for these talented entrepreneurs to thrive. So for this reason, we have gathered this stellar panel to find a way forward that draws on the lessons of their experiences as well as experiences of other countries. And I have been especially encouraged by what I've seen being developed in Ukraine for over the past years already. And I just suggest that we think about this moving forward with the discussions today. The second idea that I would like to suggest is that obviously the challenges of the startup ecosystem development are great. They're both structural and cultural. Now, most structural and all cultural challenges are created by people and hence they can be solved by people and what I find very encouraging is that most of the people that we need to solve these challenges and most of the expertise necessary is at this webinar. So as you listen to the presentations and discussions today, I would encourage you to think how could you make a contribution to those people who are in the panel, given their various efforts in supporting the startup ecosystem development in Ukraine already. So we can find a way forward and for us to push the agenda forward together. So these are the two ideas that I wanted to suggest. I'm now going to invite Andrei Sorokhan, the moderator of the panel, to make his welcoming remarks. And then we will do in the first keynote presentation of the, day, of the event. Just one housekeeping note, if you have any questions to the panel or a particular speaker, please submit them in the uh, chat uh, and we'll try to go through them at the end in the Q&A section. So without further ado, Andrei, I invite you to take over. Vadim, thank you everyone. And welcome everyone. We we have everyone, we have venture capitalists, we have accelerators, we have entrepreneurs, we have corporations, we have everyone who actually can participate in the discussion, build a meaningful One second, just a bit of a technical lag. Uh, I think uh, Andre will connect. In, reconnect in one second. Uh, yes, so while we wait for Andre, uh, all speakers uh, can turn, turn off their cameras and we'll just reconnect Andre in one second. I'm sorry, I had a technical issues. Um, so without a further, further ado, I would like to present uh, our next speaker, uh, who is Charles Whitehead. I've known Charles for a few years already, and Charles has been very active in supporting development of Ukrainian tech ecosystem with his efforts, with his ideas. Uh, Charles is a professor of law and technology at Cornell uh, University, but also is a, one of the founders of EO Incubator. Uh, one of the most active uh, early stage incubators in Ukraine. Uh, they already had few batches and Charles gathered many insights that he can share with us. So I'll, I'll pass the floor to Charles. Charles, go ahead. Great, thanks very much. Um, so I, I think Vadim, you're going to put my slides up, is that right? Fantastic. Um, so uh, so my name is Chuck Whitehead. I, um, uh, teach at Cornell, and as uh, 
Uh, Andre mentioned I'm also the, the founder of AO Business Incubators. Well, what I'll do today is provide a general background, uh, kind of set the stage for the, the discussion by the panel. Um, there's no way we can cover all the issues. Uh, my, my purpose really is just to set a baseline. Uh, so, you know, there are a number of things that one thinks about when we think about the startup system in Ukraine, the attraction of new investors, either within Ukraine or outside Ukraine, uh, a number of hurdles, a number of issues, law, uh, issues about legal reform, which are quite important, questions about corruption, the ease of doing business. Uh, I won't really touch on those. I mean, they may very well come up uh, over the course of the panel. I I'm going to focus instead on some of the core things that that very often in my experience come up when we're trying to attract uh, foreign investors uh, into Ukraine, uh, or for that matter, trying to develop a domestic uh, uh, investor community uh, within Ukraine as well. Um, okay, honey unicorns. So let's go to the next page, Vadim. So everyone knows, I think, what a unicorn is. It's a billion dollar valuation. The, you know, the history of this was that unicorns are rare, right? You rarely see them. Uh, and that's why uh, these billion dollar startup valuations uh, are, are called unicorns. In fact, they've become quite common. Next slide, please. Uh, Vadim, next slide, please. There you go. Um, they've become quite common. Uh, uh, in fact, there are hundreds of unicorns. Um, very often they are tech startups, uh, very much uh, tied into the IT space. There are exceptions like SpaceX. Uh, but very often the, the, the approach that these startups take, what makes them unique is they're using technology as a means to really change the infrastructure of very often some existing industries. Uh, and as a result of their ability to use this technology, they're able to grow quite quickly. Uh, they attract both uh, a large group of consumers, partners, as well as investors. Next slide. So what are the ingredients? Uh, to create a unicorn. In other words, what is it that you need in order to um, create an ecosystem that will support the growth of, uh, really the high growth uh, of, of large startups, uh, tech-based startups? And, and what I would suggest to you is that Ukraine has these ingredients. Uh, it has befuddled me uh, for years uh, as to why it is that Ukraine doesn't in fact attract more international investment, why it hasn't developed a local investor base when it already has the ingredients to, to succeed as a tech center. For example, uh, in terms of uh, ease of doing business, uh, the World Bank uh, has ranked uh, Ukraine consistently better. They're now number 64. Uh, obviously, there's room for improvement, uh, but this is 48 ranks higher than they were in 2014. Um, the Global Innovation Index, Ukraine is among the top 50 most innovative countries in the world. And my favorite is the Good Country Index that's circled on this page. Uh, let's click to the next slide. The World Country Index is interesting. It, um, uh, the Good Country Index, it is a measure of a country's contribution uh, to the common good of humanity. And what most people don't realize is that in the science and technology field, Ukraine is number one in the world. And whenever I mention this, my immediate, uh, the immediate reaction in Ukraine is, well, gee, who is it that actually compiles this index? Is it some Ukrainian guy? The answer is no, right? This is done by an independent uh, group uh, based upon uh, transparent open data, in many cases from the United Nations, uh, and based upon Ukraine's contribution to, again, the good of humanity, right? The, 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 the social value of, of Ukraine's contribution in the science and technology area, it is number one. So what this tells us is there's a strong tech base. It's improving, there is room for improvement, but in terms of the ability to do business, in terms of the strength of the technology, Ukraine is quite strong. Next page, please. And part of that, of course, is the strength of the people in the tech industry. Uh, it has a very strong skill set, uh, not just in IT, but really across uh, the technology sectors. Uh, when we look at technology in the incubator that I've founded, we look not just at IT, we look at hardware as well as software. We look at biotech, we look at agrotech, and Ukraine has an exceptionally deep base in terms of skill set. And part of that is because it has a strong educational system in the hard sciences. Uh, one of the things that uh, Vadim mentioned uh, was this um, uh, lack of a pipeline in the United States. 
Uh, there's increasing demand for hard science-based tech businesses. Uh, and Ukraine has a strong skill set and a strong, a strong educational base to support this. Next page. And of course, this gets realized, right? People realize uh, in, uh, outside the uh, Ukraine that there is this strong skill set, that there are these strong uh, educational uh, uh, systems. Uh, as a result, uh, there's a very strong R&D focus on Ukraine. Uh, another way of saying it is, you've got global players who have the ability to put R&D centers anywhere in the world. Ukraine is selected be precisely because of this unrealized potential. The difference is, is that the value from this R&D gets taken back to these companies, typically based outside of Ukraine, as opposed to the R&D itself being used to develop businesses in Ukraine. Uh, so the skill set is there. It's actually even being realized by large multinational tech businesses uh, who are locating their, um, their R&D operations in, in the country. Next page. Um, in addition, in the startup space, uh, there is um, a lot of what I would say high quality startups that one, uh, one, one sees. I, I have to tell you, the, the depth is not as, as, as deep as I would like. Uh, hopefully, and there are many efforts to do this, uh, there will be more of an interest in developing startups. But the ones that we do see are quite strong. This uh, particular graph is based off of a series of interviews that were done with market experts. Out of 400 startups, next slide, five of them are likely to get substantial funding and 10 of them are likely to go abroad. I, I must tell you, uh, the numbers actually for me are a little higher. At, at, at AIA, we're seeing a higher um, uh, value, a higher return, a, a higher quality um, than what these statistics suggest. Uh, next slide. And one to two will scale into large star companies. And again, my experience so far, we've had, what well, we're into our fourth, soon to our, in our fifth cycle uh, at AO. Um, the, 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 the quality and the percentage that we think are really global in nature and have the ability to become global in nature is much higher than these statistics suggest. And these are quite good. Right? If out of 400, you think there are 15 that are going to get substantial funding, 10 of which will go abroad, two of which will be superstars, this is something that investors focus on. It's certainly something that we as an incubator focus on. What I'm saying is, is that our experience so far has been even better than this. Next page. In fact, there have been a fair number of international investors who have come, uh, who have invested into Ukraine. Uh, 39 deals since 2005, including from a number, uh, these are a number of, of, of investors who are known internationally, Y Combinator, Techstars, 500 startups, and so forth. Uh, and so again, it's not to say that there isn't interest, it's not to say that there isn't a base, uh, it's not to say there isn't the skill set. In fact, to the extent that there is, uh, uh, there are investment opportunities, you have seen uh, large investors come into Ukraine. Next page. Uh, and everyone I think knows this page. Uh, this, you know, highlights some of the larger investments that have come in. Uh, it's not to say, again, that Ukraine doesn't have prominent startups that have been quite successful. And again, it's not to say that investors don't come in. But these last two slides suggest that, in fact, this is precisely what's happening. Next page. But the bulk of the investments are relatively small, right? They're in the one to $500,000 range or the less than $100,000 range. And again, this is fine. Right? When we're talking about early stage angel investments, a one to $500,000 range is fine. We're all focused on these very big deals. We're all focused on these big names. They certainly happen. But in terms of consistency, in terms of opportunity, most of the investments tend to be on the lower range. Next page. The question is whether or not this is being done on a consistent basis. In other words, is there a platform in Ukraine that is causing a uh, on a regular basis, uh, global startups, startups that have global reach uh, to actually attract investment. Uh, in other words, we clearly have seen big investments into big companies, uh, but this has been somewhat sp uh, sporadic. Uh, it's not been consistent. And the question is, why isn't that the case? What's missing for there to be a continued growth in investment in Ukraine? And I would suggest two things. One is, is that the platforms, the ecosystem for launching and growing new tech businesses uh, is uh, historically has been missing, that's changing. Uh, and secondly, that we need a strong and growing Ukrainian investor community. 
Next page. So I'm, I'm sure everyone knows this page. This is sort of a general uh, layout of, of the ecosystem in Ukraine. Um, we have uh, many of the people from uh, various parts of this ecosystem appear today on this panel. Uh, we've got uh, Ukrainian, this Ukrainian uh, startup fund, Pavlo will be speaking, uh, Dominique from Unit City, uh, Emmanuel from DTEC. Uh, of course, we have Blue Lake, um, TA Ventures, Victoria Tagipko is here. Uh, so a lot of the people who make up this ecosystem uh, are on today's panel. Uh, I'm focused really on the, on the two points on the side, uh, namely uh, investors as well as sort of platforms to develop startups. And the key point here is there have been strong, plat st strong participants in the space. More recently, they've become stronger. Next page. So quickly, just to highlight my uh, incubator, it looks like the slide got a little mucked there. Um, you know, AO is a, a US style incubator. Uh, we're based in Ukraine. Uh, we look at all technologies. Uh, we're based principally in Kiev and Kharkiv. Next page. Um, we're funded by the USAID Competitive Economy Program. So we're, we're international in terms of our DNA. You see it in terms of our mentors. The mentors are around the world. Next page. And the investors are around the world as well. And, and the point here is, to, is, just to, is just to illustrate, there is strong international interest, either through mentors or through investors, in promoting startups in Ukraine. Next page. Within Ukraine, however, the type of investors that we're seeing tend to be relatively limited. Uh, in other words, most of the capital that comes in comes in from investors from outside the country. Um, now, one of the things that comes up when you talk to investors outside Ukraine, one of the questions they always ask is who within Ukraine is investing? Uh, we'll point out to them that there's this great startup, a great opportunity. And the first question they'll ask is, well, I'm in New York or I'm in Boston, I'm in Dubai, I'm in Singapore. Who is it within Ukraine that's actually investing? One of the gates, one of the hurdles to attracting foreign capital is the absence of a strong base, a broad base. Again, we've got really great investors like TA Ventures, uh, like others, but a strong base to invest locally into Ukraine, really as anchor investors, as a way to attract foreign capital. It will both enhance the local community, um, hopefully with investors who will invest across Ukraine, uh, who will be educated, be able to do so using global standards, uh, and that will enhance the investor base within Ukraine, support new business in Ukraine, but also act as an anchor to attract foreign business, uh, foreign investors. And so the point here is really twofold, right? One, we need a platform for consistency. There needs to be high quality startups. Again, we're seeing this, Blue Lake, AO, others who are very much a part, DTEC, others who are very much a part of the, global, of the ecosystem in Ukraine, moving startups to a global platform. And we also need a, 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 a process to attract foreign investors, to do so on a consistent basis. And part of that is the development of a Ukrainian investor base. And of course, just in its own right, we want there to be a Ukrainian investor base to support the growth of these startups. Next page. So that's my basic background kind of overview of what the ecosystem looks like, where it's going, issues to consider going forward as we think about attracting both uh, Ukrainian uh, investors, as we're looking to attract foreign investors and further build the, uh, the broad ecosystem in Ukraine. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Chuck. It was very insightful and you raised some of the good points that I hope we'll discuss later. You know, overall around the world, uh, many people are discussing from the ecosystem whether government should be active, not very active in supporting the development of the ecosystem, uh, how active, etc. In Ukraine in the last years, there have been few initiatives, good initiatives that government has launched to support the development of the early stage startups. As the early stage startups are more risky and fewer investors are willing to take a risk, the government launched this initiative called Ukrainian Startup Fund, which rep is represented by Pavlo Kartashov. Uh, I'll pass the word to Pavlo to tell a bit more about the fund and um, your, your plans for the future. Thank you, Andrei. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pavlo Kartashov, and I am CEO of Ukrainian Startup Fund. Uh, so today, I briefly will present... Uh, yeah, yeah. 
I will briefly <clears throat> present uh, a Ukrainian fund, uh, startup fund and uh, just make a short introduction how it works, uh, how fund uh, operates and uh, what our procedures are. Next slide, please. Next one. Uh, so, uh, actually, fund was established in 2018 uh, by the government of Ukraine, and uh, we started our uh, operational activity from August 2019. So, as for today, uh, we actually have been operating more than one year, and we have actually first results. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, so, creation of USF was caused by certain challenges. Uh, facing the startup ecosystem, which have been observed in Ukraine for past years. Um, <clears throat> actually, first of all, we point out uh, four main challenges, and namely, these are uh, limited coordination between ecosystem stakeholders. Secondly, it's limited funding opportunities at the early stages. Uh, thirdly, it's uh, the need to develop uh, key business skills. And last but not least, it, it's insufficient knowledge of uh, Ukraine by its technological startups. Uh, next slide, please. So here comes the question, what should be uh, done next? And uh, the answer was creation of USF. Uh, so as I mentioned from December 2018, uh, <clears throat> USF was created. And uh, from uh, <clears throat> December uh, last year, we started to uh, collect uh, applications. So as for today, uh, we collected more than 2,000 uh, applications for the grant. And uh, our focus is on startups with uh, early stages, uh, and namely these are pre-seed and seed stages. Uh, <clears throat> the main uh, tool of our financing is grant. So we don't take any stakes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so over the next five years, uh, USF intends to support efforts to address the uh, challenges facing Ukrainian uh, startups and the ecosystem. Uh, how exactly should we do this? Uh, we support startups at the early stages with no stakes. Uh, also, we finance the training of startups in national and international accelerators. Uh, so, as for the moment, we started accreditation of uh, accelerators, and uh, this uh, is still an ongoing process. As for now, we have more than 10 applications, and hopefully uh, next month, uh, we will launch uh, the grant program, I mean, acceleration grant program. And also, we offer new financial and non-financial opportunities for startups. Uh, for example, it's venture capital. So we are trying to build a pipeline from the <clears throat> precede stage till the round A, B, C, so on. Next slide, please. So uh, let's start from theory to practice. How to get a grant? Uh, receiving a grant is based on four principles. So, first of all, all the procedures are in electronic form. Uh, secondly, uh, the whole process is automated. Uh, next, all decisions are personal and independent, so we don't interfere into the process. Uh, it's done uh, independently by our experts, and the uh, fund <coughs> uh, staff makes only some legal checks, and that's it, compliance checks. And uh, there is uh, minimum contacts with the fund staff. So we don't uh, give any consultations. Uh, it could be only technical assistance, but uh, with regard to application, uh, we don't provide any, uh, any assistance or, uh, or any advices. So next slide, please. So the stages of receiving the grant are clear and uh, understandable. So first you register, uh, when you read the grant program, uh, then you actually uh, accept all the requirements. 
you apply and receive a decision. Next slide. Uh, then application passes internal compliance check and expert evaluation. And if you get <clears throat> enough points, you will be invited to a pitch. Cope with it, wait for the supervisory board decision, then sign a contract and get a grant. So it's very simple, uh, <clears throat> but you need to comply with all the requirements and uh, fit to all the program parts. Next slide. So what are the results? As for today, uh, we have more than 2,000 applications. Uh, we actually held uh, more, uh, now except, uh, expect 11 pitch, but we held already 10 pitches. Half of them was uh, online pitches, uh, half of uh, them was offline. And uh, we have already provided grants to most 30 companies with total sum more than one and a half million of US dollars. And next slide. So here you can see uh, what are the main industries uh, which was covered by the applications. So uh, I believe uh, this is how Ukrainian ecosystem looks like. Uh, we don't actually have any differentiation by industries, so we accept applications in uh, each of them. So as for now, uh, as I mentioned, we have more than 2,000 applications and uh, hopefully now the total uh, number of applications uh, are increasing. So this is brief outlook how Ukrainian Startup Fund operates and uh, I would like to have to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Pavla. Um, it's a great presentation. Uh, would like to clarify a few things. How many startups are you planning to support in the next year? Um, are there any limits or you'll take it as it goes? Actually, we're limited by uh, amount of money available. So as for now, it's more than 15 million of US dollars. So I believe at least three, four years we are feeling very confident. And uh, moreover, we have a top up, uh, annual top, top up uh, actually envisaged in state budget. So uh, we uh, expect additional 2 million of US dollars annually. Okay, that's, that's very promising for, for people who are working on startups nowadays. Um, so let me let me move move forward and thank you Charles and thank you Pavla for a great introductory uh, presentations. Uh, we have a great panel ahead um, and I'll tell a few words about myself. I represent uh, a Western AS Enterprise Fund, which is the first private equity fund in Ukraine, uh, and transform into one of the biggest private equity fund now, Horizon Capital. As a Western AS Enterprise Fund, we have two uh, main streams, and one of them is uh, supporting. Uh, development of uh, you know economic legacy and supporting social impact projects and the second one is uh, investing in early stage startups uh, we've been investing in ukraine for more than 20 years i've seen many you know changes ups and downs in ukraine and now it's uh, very exciting actually to see the development of technological companies uh, in ukraine uh, so having worked with startups for a few years i've accumulated few insights and would be also uh, interested to hear the, the the thoughts from the speakers today. Uh, you know, we will we will not be here if there if there will be no entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurs is the key are the key drivers here in Ukraine, and we would like to see more of them. Uh, and without in our panel, we have really three strong uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, and I would like to you know they're all in different stages of of running the business. Somebody only starting like Dima or Kirill or, and Alex are already raised millions of dollars in venture capital. So I would like to start with Dima. Uh, Dima, you, you know, you lived in Ukraine, you worked in venture capital, uh, you studied in the US, lived in the US, and now got back to, to Kiev and started your uh, company now. Can you tell a little bit more about your kind of story, what you're working on, and why did you decide to do it in Ukraine? You had options to do it, uh, you know, elsewhere. Uh, can you share a little bit more about that? Sure, sure. 
Hey everyone, um, just a short introduction. So my name is uh, Dima. I'm the CEO and co-founder of organization GG. And um, we as a, hum as a company, we help uh, pro gamers and streamers to boost their income by offering shared experiences to their fans. So um, imagine you could directly interact with your favorite gamer or streamer, not just watch them on Twitch. But if you're not into esports, I will give a, a different analogy. So if you're into football, it's like, you know, being on a no camp stadium and having an opportunity to play with Massey. Um, so this is, this is what we do. Uh, the reason why I started, so, and we started the company in February this year, um, before, you know, anyone uh, could uh, preview of the, of the consequences of the COVID. Um, and the reason why I started in Ukraine, I mean, Ukraine has, a great potential and a great resource of outstanding developers. Um, and obviously, if you compare, you know, the, the prices to start the business uh, in the US or Ukraine, it's much easier and much cheaper um, to do it from here. And, um, you know, after COVID situation, a lot of my friends who live in San Francisco, you know, they just uh, escape from the city since the prices are still as high, both uh, the living costs and the development costs, um, but the opportunities sort of uh, sink. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's the reason why we started off in Ukraine. Hmm. If not the costs, do you, do you have enough talent to hire in your team? Do you, are you worrying about the capital in the early stages? What are the challenges you're facing, if any? Well, we, as I said, we didn't know that COVID is coming, but it actually played to our hand since, um, you know, a lot of talented guys who were working at specific companies, they, they uh, were looking for some other opportunities. Some were sacked from the companies that they're working, uh, that they were working at. So um, it opened up a huge um, pool of talents that we could tap into. And since a lot of people were bored, uh, you know, some of them were happy to take side projects. And this was actually the way we started working with, uh, with my co-founder, um, Denise, uh, who is the CTO. Um, but of course, I mean, the talent pool is excellent. And this is, I, I think this is one of the main reasons, um, you know, why people start the companies in Ukraine. But the fundraising and the access to capital is, is scarce. And I, I'd focus on this part more because I think this is the topic of our current conversation. Um, so essentially for us, there were sort of two ways uh, to get funding. The first one was uh, Ukrainian Startup Fund, and I'll focus on this for, for now. I think Ukrainian Startup Fund is an amazing initiative. Um, you know, for us, it was the single point of getting finance quickly. So we did um, apply. Um, and we got in, like we got invited to the to the demo day. But uh, since um, since Pavel is here, there are a couple of points that I want to point out from uh, from an entrepreneur perspective. So first, the application process. Like I've been applying to um, to accelerators, like to 500 startups, to Y Combinator. The application forms are easier than the application form for for the Ukrainian startup fund. It took us a while. Um, to sort of, you know, prepare it. It's not a problem for us, but I know that there are already some guys on the market offering their service to help submit the application form and they charge $1,000 for that. And, uh, you know, I think we, like bringing this uh, barrier that high for the application form kind of creates this opportunity for these subsidiary services to exist. And I think this shouldn't be the case. Um, the other thing that uh, relates to Ukrainian startup fund is the timeline of decision making. So we applied three months ago uh, and it took about six weeks for comedy to make their decision. So we got two yeses from the, from the jury uh, and we were super happy about it because we thought, you know, we're going to get funding in the next whatever month. But we realized that there is a next stage called the demo day. And uh, the next available date for demo day was two months away. Uh, so, you know, two months away. And if we win the demo day, then there's another month for us to actually get the funding. So for us as a startup, it translated into six months 
of waiting for the check of twenty thousand dollars before we apply like when we applied we were a pre-seed um we were at pre-seed stage because we didn't have an mvp so we applied for a twenty thousand dollar check uh but you know currently we have an mvp we already have first customers so we wouldn't be you know we wouldn't be able to take those twenty thousand because we would violate the terms because we already have the you know the mvp working um and i think you know there should be a way uh to sort of receive those money much much faster because six months for such a vulnerable uh, stage that our company is at is just too much um and you know i would happy to hear some of the thoughts maybe from pavel or i know victoria is you know is also on the board of uh, ukrainian startup fund maybe you know we could figure out a, a solution um to make this process much short, shorter because i think it's indeed a very big problem for for the U ukrainian startup fund although i love the idea and i love the initiative okay thank you dima i think we'll we can take it a little bit later on paolo you can maybe answer it uh, uh later but i think you know uh thank you for bringing up these points um but i'll move to kirill now and uh and kirill uh, and Alex actually are the rare breed of entrepreneurs who are actually building global companies, but based in Kiev, uh, and they raise millions of uh, dollars in capital. Uh, can you, let's start with Kirill. Can you, Kirill, share your story? What inspired you to start a startup here? And why did you, you know, moving along the way, raising capital, you had a chance to move elsewhere. Why did you decide to do it here? Are there any constraints uh, in your business doing it from Ukraine? And what are your plans for the future, though? Wow, that's uh, thank you, thank you for the introduction, and that's uh, a lot to answer um, in in five minutes. So I will try to be very brief. Um, we started back in 2012, so it's already uh, kind of a journey of eight and a half years, um, and we started mostly because we have accelerator who gave us, you know, first uh, twenty thousand uh, dollars. We failed the first product and. Uh, we spent those twenty thousand dollars on that product. After that, we started thinking about the next, uh, the next product, next company, and uh, we raised again uh, from um, uh, from angel investors. Uh, it was two hundred thousand dollars, and we still we still couldn't find a product market fit. Indeed, we invested this uh, cash into the building product and launching in the U.S. But after that, we would consider this as a failure. Uh, because we couldn't find, uh, you know, a good fit to the market. And then in 2013, we started from scratch again, and, um, um, and we haven't raised anything until 2015. So it was uh, two years of bootstrapping, and I think it was two years of uh, a lot of experience where all the three founders were super hands-on, and it helped us to learn a lot um, about, about the business. And I think you know we 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 basically spent the first uh, three years uh, of company life in in Kiev. Uh, then we applied to TechStars in 2015. Uh, we got 100, I think it was 120 uh, thousand dollars from TechStars. Also, a Samarka fund invested at this at that stage as well. Um, so we raised uh, 220 thousand dollars at that moment. Um, uh, we went through TechStars. Berlin. We selected Berlin because most of our revenue was from uh, Europe at that moment. Um, and then in 2016, we raised first significant round. It was 1.1 uh, 1 million, but we also counted all the safes and notes that we raised before. So we announced 1.3 million, and we were super lucky with the, super lucky with the investors. So there were a couple of um, venture funds from Poland. Uh, a couple of funds from Ukraine and two amazing business angels. So one of them was Arthur Kosten, uh, who was co who is co-founder of Booking.com and was CMO of Booking until 2013. And another one was Marius Bralevsky, um, who is co-founder of Dot Planner, one of the largest marketplaces for doctors in the world. And I think they were key for our success because both of them understand marketplace business very well much deeper than anyone else who invested before um and uh i would even say that they 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 they, they know marketplace business and how to scale it better 
probably still providing a lot of value for us and better than some of the existing investors that join after. Um, so I think if you're thinking about, you know, development of Ukrainian ecosystem, that's what we should striving for to find such angels and, uh, you know, help them help startups to be connected to such angels um, or have such people with such experience on the, on our, in, on, on, on one of, as one of the partners um, at our venture firms, uh, because they provided, you know, the value that I, it's, it's very difficult to, you know, um, um, uh, to, to overestimate. Thank you, Kirill. Probably you'll be one of these angels too. Once you build your company and, and, and exit it, you'll have, you'll accumulate a lot of expertise and you'll be very uh, good angel investor too. Um, so let's move to Alex. Um, Alex, you've, you know, you, you, you've worked in your company as well for, for some years and you worked with different investors from Ukraine and from other countries. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about your experience working with both, if you have any from Ukraine as well, and what are you thinking about where the Ukrainian ecosystem is heading and uh, what are the, you know, next steps in developing it? Yeah, cool. Great question. Thank you. Can you turn off my video back? Because I couldn't. It like, because host prohibit. Oh, yeah. Uh, perfect. Hi, guys. My, it's actually my story is very similar with Kirill, like where we failed uh, first company, but the story starts from my own money and actually uh, all the experiments actually <laughs> was on our own money. And uh, yeah, long story short, computer is like six years old right now. Yeah, we are operating globally, uh, sitting uh, in Ukraine and we have employee in uh, UK, uh, US, but there's just a few persons and in Asia. Uh, in Singapore, and uh, uh, back days, yeah, and back to we founded the company in 2012, and actually it was super hard to get any extra funding, and uh, comparison to like five years back is actually right now is dramatically different situation. A lot of the funds, uh, Victoria is super active as well and support you. Like five years ago, it was nothing. It's actually empty lands. And like, I just tried to just ask a few guys who is, was super close to the IT business here and they want to take at least like 30% of my company for 20K investment. And it was really crazy. And uh, we actually, uh, yeah, we rise today something around $3 million. We not publicly announced all that stuff uh, because uh, we actually uh, made it probably a few mistakes, but I can consider right now, we actually was um, invited in YC Combinator er, early days. And actually I said, no, <laughs> because I can't understood why we need this support that moment. <laughs> and maybe it's some, some founder curiosity and actually our, actually I am overestimate uh, our power in business knowledge right now i actually see the curial story the good advisors really can help you just to avoid some mistakes early and uh, from my stand position right now we tried to fundraise but we started in a bad time like in november last year and actually this like the christmas happens and then COVID happens and we postpone all that stuff for the future and we're planning our like series a fundraising early next year and again, what I can see right now, like the steel for Ukrainian, especially if you're building like B2B enterprise software, is still trust is number one. And I just demonstrate a lot of the metrics and the, my friends or the founders of the big night company said, Alex, if we had the same numbers all that you had to date, we can attract any money in UK or US. But I spent like two years last, like mostly like two weeks here, two weeks in UK, and it's still same problems. I'm just not in front of the club. No one knows Alex, just in person. I can show the any metrics, any key studies. You can analyze our website. There's a lot of the marketing stuff there, but still from the investor, they should know the investor who has invest previously, like in person. And actually as my suggestion, if like, I know that only probably Victoria in like ICU right now, so who is investors in Ukraine, who is, has a strong connections outside the Ukraine. 
but the, most of the rest is no. And actually, it's really important to get this trust on if you do the serious A fundraising. They really, uh, the investors actually trying to understand like who is your previous investors and do we can believe you guys. And more, maybe it's probably like it's a B2B enterprise. It's actually again, uh, is like is a super trust doing thing because we're changing the crucial uh, business process in their organizations. But right now, situation is much better. We actually our plans to keep our company here. Uh, yeah, including myself. Like yeah, I will move to US for like some period of time just to help. Uh, like not me personally, like our head of sales from UK, my head of pro uh, professional sales, etc. We will make this like squad who will run the market, hire the local team, and then we will move to the another country, etc. But we will keep our uh, engineer, engineering support here in Ukraine, and a lot of the customers, even like we are just going to sign a huge deal with a number two billion dollar retailer. He mentioned like I really worrying like do they believe that Ukrainians can support? Uh, their pr software, as I said, Alex, all our engineering and all our support right now, based whatever, and like in India, Philippines, etc., outside US, is not a problem at all. This is why I think it's like it's a good time coming, and we can build a unicorn sitting in Ukraine. That's very promising. Thank you for sharing your story, Alex. Kirill, did you actually have similar issues that Alex had questioning the invest the previous investors when you were raising around, like Ukrainian investors that you had? Uh, frankly speaking, um, I didn't have concerns of my previous investors, uh, but it, I would say that unfortunately, they also didn't mean much when you're raising in investing countries. So if you're raising in Germany or UK or US, at this stage, you know, names of Ukrainian funds don't, don't mean much, um, unfortunately, right? Um, yeah, but what, is, what I agree with, uh, with Alex, then when we are talking about uh, VC ecosystem um, in, in Ukraine, it's crucial actions, investor funds, and be able to you know engage western fund when when is needed uh, either it's the next stage of growth or the same round also have a connections with the key business angels um in europe and in the us who co who can join the round uh, straight away um and as yeah so it, it's it's actually can be additional value proposition um of the fund so when we invest we also bring to get along uh, along ourselves a couple of business angels that understand your business very well, either it's, you know, SaaS enterprise business or marketplace. That's great, Kirill. Well, let's move to the venture capital uh, side of, of things. Uh, we have actually Victoria, who is a founding partner and managing partner of uh, TA Ventures. Uh, and actually, this is the fund who invests both in Ukraine and in Europe and other countries. Uh, Victoria, can you share a little bit about, um, you know, your fund and where you invest? And actually, imagine if I could give you $50 million now uh, without, you know, asking much. Where would you invest in Ukraine? Uh, which stage, area, industries, just purely for, for the regional uh, uh, fund? Thank you. And hi, everybody. Yeah, uh, thank you for $50 million. <laughs> <laughs> first of all <laughs> and uh, just a quick uh, insight so on where we are now actually uh, for the startup ecosystem in ukraine is a good moment now so what we are seeing from the um, international investors we invest in europe and us just to give some uh, figures we invested directly 121 companies exited 32 uh, invested 31 million into the companies directly and all in all almost 70 million in uh, all the 147 companies so far with the um, uh, special opportunities uh, club deals uh, through their friends uh, pre-seed funds etc etc so um, just um, a sentiment from the market um, um, a lot of bigger funds or u.s funds and european funds are eager to see the, uh, now the companies and energy center the, the energy centers in our territory so it's much much easier now to attract a capital to Ukrainian startups and uh, not asking them to go to US um, as just was mentioned now by Sergey so it's not necessary now so it, even vice versa so they're asking the 
um, uh, R&D teams and uh, those who stay in US or in Europe actually move to Ukraine, to Belarus, uh, to Eastern European countries from where, where the original the developers are and be there, build the company there. With all this like COVID situation, it will be huge rethinking on their standards, on how we build companies, how we connect, how we work together, all these distributed systems, etc. So this is something which is getting hyped now. Um, regarding the Ukrainian ecosystem, uh, we have to understand one thing. So uh, having invested 121 companies and reached 32 exits and out of them uh, 20 uh, positive, uh, the situation, uh, sorry, 32 exit positive and uh, 11 uh, negative, like bankruptcies, etc. So um, the, uh, the outcome is uh, following. So when we are investing in Europe and in US, uh, actual Ukrainian, um, Ukrainian um, entrepreneurs do compete with the smart kids from these territories as well. So, and uh, they do really have to stand out to, for, uh, to persuade um, uh, US or German funds or European funds, whatever, to choose between uh, their local entrepreneurs and the Ukrainian entrepreneurs. And this is hard. This is hard because these guys are really smart uh, in US and Europe, and it's super hard to compete with them. And uh, like, what I would, would say that the mediocre startup from Germany, let's say, get better financing than the good startup from Ukraine, but that happens because they're from the territory, that they're happy to babysit them, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't have this ecosystem in Ukraine, and just to uh, make uh, like uh, to sum up, so what what we have to do? I mean, we have to breed the generation of the super smart entrepreneurs here. We help, we should help them to inject this like sales DNA uh, to be able to market their product better because we have amazing tech talents. I mean, don't, don't need to speak about this. Charles already uh, highlighted some interesting figures, but uh, what we do like, we do like presenting ourselves properly. We do need to stand out because that that's sometimes is a crucial and uh, uh, point when you are pitching to the um, to the funds in the US and Europe, and they have a choice, local or international or Ukrainian, let's say. Okay, we have to be able to push and pitch properly. We have to be able to have these sales skills, uh, product skills, etc. So this education is actually lacking. This is another big topic to discuss, and this is what we are discussing also during our USF board meetings, etc. How to build this competence, where to where to go, how to learn this competence, how to start from scratch, basically, because we are smart, but we lack these major competences which stand out uh, for the uh, international uh, visa community to choose Ukrainian entrepreneurs uh, 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 and not uh, local. This is one important thing. Then another thing, we are doing a bunch of different mistakes uh, we can avoid by creating the community of UA entrepreneurs globally. So this is something we discussed also at USF, and I think that it, it, it would be the good outcome of this Adam Smith conference online today, just to create the community and to start building this uh, international UA entrepreneurs and investors community globally. So the better we uh, put everybody on board, family, families, high net worth individuals, I mean, whoever is interested in innovations, entrepreneurship, et cetera, whoever is interested in talents originally from Ukraine should be on this uh, community, whatever, I mean, uh, 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 let, uh, we have to decide um, wh where to create this community and which uh, and which uh, messenger or whatever. So maybe we can have a separate like conversation on this. But this might help a lot because the guys which got the financing, the big um, names uh, which are on the list and which got the financing in 19, in 18, etc. I don't want to m m mention all of them, but GitLab, like the guys from uh, People AI and uh, Grammarly, also all said different, different, uh, probably also. So all, all, all other smart uh, entrepreneurs and successful entrepreneurs who've got the, this uh, uh, financing, who know how to um, deal with the international VC community, um, should uh, contribute somehow to, to uh, just to avoid the mistakes by younger entrepreneurs from Ukraine. Because that really matters. So sometimes one example, I, I can give you a bunch of examples when like a like piece of advice from the uh, entrepreneur, um, inter like top tier entrepreneurs uh, during one like conferences and coffee break, whatever, change the path of the companies we've been investing. And that, that does mean a lot. So we have, uh, that's what we are see seeing. There are a lot of mistakes, uh, repeat repeating, repeating mistakes uh, done by the different entrepreneurs in Ukraine. And we just easily can avoid by just dropping the like, core equation to this 
uh, for this whatever community, messenger community, and uh, I mean get it get it solved, and also advise uh, intros to families, bunch of families. That's what we are seeing with our iClub community, the, the, a club which is investing in uh, startups in Ukraine, in US, in Europe, whatever where we are investing, which is opening these locations for them. There are a lot of inter uh, families and high net worth living in uh, Europe and US, and we have an access to them. So, and uh, for iClub, um, uh, we do not charge. At the, as a iClub Global, we do not charge a penny from investments down into the Ukrainian startups. Then we can we can do something all together. We have to create the cast of Ukrainian investors, high net worth, uh, entrepreneurs, etc., by clubbing them in the similar organizations like iClub, etc. So just to show them, to pitch them, maybe you can do some like a special events uh, on a regular basis because they just do not know about the opportunities which are uh, 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 arising in Ukraine. And surprisingly, in the US, we have gotten like thousands of uh, requests. I mean, the uh, US is also a startup. So just, just the question of, uh, um, which was dropped by by the previous speaker. So just um, we, we can adjust. I mean, it's not a big issue to change a little bit the application form. There are some fields which should be filled by uh, by by uh, by law. We cannot avoid them. But all in all, we are happy to adjust and happy to make more um, demo days, uh, do it quicker, etc. Because in the best, uh, our the best desire is just to uh, inject the more capital possible to the early. Uh, startups uh, which will develop uh, the important issue they, they will develop their business and they will be grounded in ukraine so they will develop firstly their business in ukraine because this is our uh, like uh, national interest uh, of the usf and whatever is um, connected with this activity so uh, again to sum up so i think that uh, this like war uh, community for, of ukrainian entrepreneurs and investors and family offices and the high net worth globally would help a lot to avoid a bunch of mistakes and create this investment community uh, then um, the educational platform where the ukrainian entrepreneurs can be able to get grants whatever from uh, international um, uh, communities like USAID, etc., just to go and study uh, somewhere to understand the product, the sales, the marketing, the everything which we are lacking, being a perfect developers and being sold as a developers previously for tens of years. So this should be changed actually. And another um, uh, thing, this is the right time now with this post-COVID uh, rethinking of where to be uh, working uh, on a distance, a distributed team, etc. for Ukrainian startups is a good moment to uh, stand out and to uh, raise financing internationally. That's what we are seeing actually from the sentiment from our friends, uh, investors from US and Europe. Thank you, Victoria. Um, great ideas. It seems you're saying that, yeah, we need more entrepreneurs and the way to, to get more entrepreneurs is A, help current entrepreneurs with educational programs and building community. Uh, B, kind of attract new entrepreneurs who are not yet entrepreneurs, but they might be entrepreneurs who are at work at some jobs, uh, but they can become entrepreneurs. And you can do this through maybe capital uh, and, and some other incentives. And maybe see something that we haven't discussed, but perhaps might touch later, attract entrepreneurs from other countries to be uh, building companies from here. Um, that's, uh, that's another uh, way of doing this as well. But David, for example, is representing... Um, Blue Lake Accelerator. He's a founding partner and director of uh, Vimes VC. Uh, so David is actually working with early stage entrepreneurs. Uh, I would be curious in both Europe and Ukraine, and I would be curious to hear your perspective, David, um, you know, as you start working with Ukrainian entrepreneurs, um, what, what, are, what are the gaps here? Are there any potential? And since you're open and actively working here, you, you definitely believe in, in the potential here. Where do you see this ecosystem moving and how can we accelerate the growth here? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, guys, for joining this afternoon. I know there's uh, loads of events uh, today, so I see there are 165 participants. So uh, we are doing well. Um, thanks for the question. Um, as you mentioned, at the Blue Lake, we are down at the trenches. Uh, so we started around 12 months ago as an early stage, uh, seed pre-seed level VC fund and startup accelerator. Uh, we hail originally from the sunny London and uh, we are focused on Ukraine and there is a good reason, uh, good reason for it. So I was really engrossed in Chuck's presentation at the start 
uh, because pretty much I agree with everything that, that he said, and I think if we build up on it, uh, we can get a very clear picture. So Ukraine's ecosystem compared to the UK or Europe is a weird one. Um, so on the one hand, you, you have these, you know, the monsters, you know, you have your Grammarly's, your, your people AI's, um, Luxury, all, all the guys, you know, with the pet cubes a while back, the guys that we know and love. Um, on the other hand, once you look at the grassroots, and this, I think, what, what Chuck was mentioning, there isn't much going on. And so I'm, I'm setting aside events, you know, all the get together, networking, great, fun. Um, but compared to the UK, uh, compared to Europe, compared to Poland, where there is, you know, they're, they're fighting for each startup for, for, for hearts and minds, um, at the gra grassroots level, there isn't much happening. So um, in my opinion, there could be two different answers. Ukraine is just different, you know, and um, you, can, you can have your, your GitLabs without, uh, without the, the, the early stage startups, you know, you can get that milk without the cow. Or B, the startups, the companies that we all know, the, the big boys, the guys that made it, especially in the US, they're the exceptions, you know, they're on the, on the right side of that bell curve. And there are far, far too many early stage startups that unnecessarily go bust. And I think some of the entrepreneurs, some of the founders have addressed this already. Um, at the early stages, at the grassroots, and this is where the magic happens. And, and it happens both um, in terms of the benefits for the country, for the ecosystem, and for the investors, quite frankly. Yeah, this is where you get, uh, you get your nice chunk of equity for a pretty low price. I wouldn't say there is nothing, but the activity is pretty, pretty low. And as Pablo said, you know, it isn't for the lack of startups, uh, the applications, and it's funny how, you know, you have 2000 applications, even though the form may be clunky, but there are still quite a significant number of startups still powering through it. So that tells us something. So to circle back, um, and I, I want to pick up on the question that you asked Victoria about the 50 million and of course I, I love numbers and it always helps to put things in perspective. And I think I can do better than uh, give a hypothetical. I'll tell you what we are doing. So we think that there is a real need for a number of early stage funds that are going to be operate at the pre-seed level. So I would say maybe five, 10 million funds a number of those with different specialties, with, uh, with different competences. And then you will have a larger fund, um, again, either Ukraine-based or Ukraine-focused, that can provide those follow-on investments. And this will be that foundation that will then help the founders to go abroad and fundraise, to grow and be successful. Um, I think that this will happen. Blue Lake, other companies. So this week we've been approached by two separate partners for launching a seed level 5 million funds, uh, Ukraine oriented. You know, I'm sure there are many, many more companies like that. So I see that we had this magical stage. There's like a time machine. So this is when things are happening in Ukraine right now. In about five, seven years time, there'll be people hitting themselves on the forehead and like saying, oh, well, you know, I wish I was there. And this is the reason why we are doing what we are doing at Blue Lake, because we see that this is the right place, right time. And, um, you know, quite frankly, we are, we are excited about the prospects. It's not easy, uh, but with the right approach, you know, for the companies, for the VCs that are willing to get their hands dirty as we are, yeah, we're loving it. Thank you, David. So are, have you started working already with some startups or are you only launching here in Ukraine? No, so we are... Um, We, we started about 12 years ago. Um, we had overall roundups going through the accelerator with three of them receiving direct investments. Um, right now, we are raising a new fund. Um, so we are having the fun of uh, working with the UK and the EU regulators. This is my personal hell. Uh, but once that's, uh, that's finished, we will we'll pick up our activity. So right now, I guess the past 12 months can be considered for us as a kind of market test, something that we always advise our startups before you jump in. 
spend the time testing the market. Uh, we did that um, and we like what we are seeing. So uh, we are planning to close the fundraise around November time and then pick up our activity significantly. But we are investing on a one-off basis, on continued basis. Okay, thank you, David. Um, so I would like to move on and continue on the accelerator um, topic and kind of how to educate more, uh, more successful early stage startups. And I would like to move to, to Charles Whitehead again. Um, and Charles, you know, you've seen entrepreneurs both in the US, Europe, Ukraine, you've worked with Ukrainian entrepreneurs for a few years already and, and accumulated some of the insights. Uh, I, I was wondering, what, what do you think about, you know, are there any differences where the Ukrainian entrepreneurs stand? Are there any potential? What, what's your take on this? Sure. So thank you. So, so uh, I would start with the positives that we've seen in Ukraine. So the, the entrepreneurs that we work with, uh, those with technical experience are quite good. Uh, classical education, real experience, uh, very strong at what they're doing. And, and again, the, the focus here is not just on IT or, or, or coding. Uh, we see it across a broad range of hard sciences. That's for a second, incredibly hardworking. Folks work very hard. Uh, I, I kid with the, uh, the teams in our incubator. They work hard by European standards. Uh, but what, it's a joke. They work hard. Um, very creative. You know, it, it's interesting. Uh, when I first came to Ukraine about five, six years ago, uh, I was told by some folks that it was difficult to find a, a creative Ukrainian startup. Uh, that uh, for educational or other reasons, uh, folks were not as, as creative in developing new businesses as perhaps they, they could be. And I, I have found that to not be the case in terms of the models and the thought process and the products and the services, again, quite creative. The big holdback uh, has been understanding the, the, the business of business, uh, thinking like a business person, thinking, uh, really taking these creative ideas and, and molding them into something that uh, is more understandable uh, to someone who is an investor who is more familiar with business models they might see in the United States or in Europe. Victoria talked about, you know, when you're dealing with funds in the United States or Europe, uh, you know, they've got to decide, am I going to, you know, if I'm in Boston, am I eating a hamburger or am I eating, you know, pirozhki, right? What, what, is it, what is it that I'm going to be focused on? And and the fact of the matter is U.S. investors, and, and this is true, I think, in, in many countries, um, because it's a, a foreign country, because they don't necessarily have people there or experience there, they have to be convinced that there's a real value in Ukraine. Um, and once they understand the tech and the product and they've met the people, in my experience, it's not been a problem. The, the real problem has been almost a vocabulary, getting people to think like an investor would think, getting people to think like an entrepreneur would think outside Ukraine, uh, getting them to develop a business model that uh, makes sense, not just within Ukraine, but works, you know, in Chicago. Part of that is, you know, and for all of you who are doing startups, you know, it's client discovery, it's all that great stuff. But really at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is almost a vocabulary and a thought process and a way of presenting an idea that an investor in, in Boston is going to understand just as easily as if they were dealing with a startup based in Boston. And, and I think that's what Blue Lake is focused on. That's what we're focused on. Uh, when we talk about creating uh, businesses that are along the lines of global standards, we're not talking about the tech itself or the product. Again, those things tend to be quite strong we've seen. We're talking about adjusting them or adjusting the business model or better adjusting the product to reflect the, uh, the, the interests of people outside Ukraine. Uh, there's a lot of inward looking focus. I tell people, if you're going to Google information, use uh, a U.S. address. Uh, you, we want you to be focused on markets and, and, and opportunities and, and a thought process that exists outside Ukraine, because at the end of the day, many of your investors will be located abroad and your markets will be outside Ukraine. And I think that's the biggest difference. I mean, there are, there are infrastructure issues. Uh, Victoria mentioned funding. Uh, certainly that's an issue. Um, Part of that's being addressed with uh, the Ukrainian Startup Fund. Uh, I, I also have the, the, the pleasure of being on the board of that fund. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, 
uh, it's not so much the, the funding opportunities, those will come. Uh, I think it's the process by which the businesses can really be able to demonstrate that they are global in reach in a way that partners, uh, investors, others will understand outside Ukraine. I just want to add quickly, uh, Charles, just quickly add, so we have to be realistic and uh, for Ukrainian startup, uh, way easier to uh, persuade the um, uh, European, Asian, American funds uh, to invest in the tech and intelligence models, first of all, because that's our competence. I mean, we are, we are like uh, well known for tech talent, right? Light models, tech and intelligence models, because they can be extrapolated. They can work, for, it doesn't matter from where. It's much more difficult uh, to work in the consumer space. It's much more difficult to build international cross geographical businesses uh, when you don't know consumers. It's hard to persuade uh, American investors that we can do business with the consumers in US being in Ukraine right so then uh, i mean being realistic that we have to be focused on tech and talent businesses but not only and if there are different models and if there are smart entrepreneurs there then the funds should be ready to babysit who are these funds who are ready to be babysit we have to understand and be really clear on this the funds should be able to babysit and we don't have these funds in ukraine american international we don't have them present there too ready to babysit that's an issue so that's my point is real and straightforward. So we have to build our own ecosystem of experts, advisors, uh, people with money, high net worth, entrepreneurs and CEOs, whatever, they have money. They can club deals and babysit our startups, which are not in the tech and talent intensive space. Just that, that's uh, my major point. So, and just yeah, yeah, no, I, and I, and I, I, inject I, this I DNA that. to the startups. They have to learn how to sell, and they cannot sell. They cannot learn it. In, either they, they have this with the um, with the milk of their mothers, uh, then they have, can sell and they can market. They they can sell on the sell side, but it's it's really rare in Ukraine. Rare because we don't have these trainings. We don't have the uh, ecosystem, uh, learning ecosystem from the kindergarten, the school, etc., which uh, force I mean uh, young kids to sell, to present, blah, 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 and all this thing. This is a, an issue here. And we have to understand how to bring the people, how to bring this competence from the three years old uh, and onwards, or to learn those who are eager to learn uh, online and offline somewhere, they, they will understand the difference. So that's important. I mean, we, there are some structural issues and some realities. So we have to be focused on where it will transfer into the uh, clear results. Take intelligent businesses and create the network of sympathetic those who are really interested in to support Ukrainian ecosystem globally uh, to babysit other startups from different verticals. That's, uh, that's just to sum up. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. No, I, and I think that's right. Uh, uh, the, the, the question again, and I think we're actually saying much the same thing, but the question is how do you create a business, particularly if your market is outside Ukraine, where Ukraine-based entrepreneurs can relate to the customers can, can demonstrate to investors and others that they understand the market. How do I sell in Chicago if I've never been to Chicago? Um, and we've seen a couple of ways in which this has been done. Uh, in a few of the cases coming out of, of, uh, of our incubator, uh, they've actually hooked up with uh, people outside Ukraine who have that experience. And so we, we have one, uh, one startup that is graduated, what, three months ago, they're at about a $20 million valuation now. They've been quite successful. And that's because they've wor they're working with uh, people in Germany and, uh, and in the United States. Uh, so, I, I, you know, again, the tech, the drive, the, the, the innovation is there. Uh, once they are able to get to a stage where they can credibly show they understand the local markets, you begin to see a fair amount of, of active interest. Um, you know, in addition to the incubators, Blue Lake, uh, in addition to uh, the other sort of research focused centers, DTEC, AO, uh, there are now increasingly programs to educate people on entrepreneurship in universities, in colleges, in schools. Uh, and you're beginning to see that as well. Um, so I think the combination, right? Again, this is the, the thought process, the ability to think like business people, the ability to present a business. I think that's evolving relatively quickly uh, but I agree with you, Victoria. Right? It's still that that, that is the hurdle. Um, it's not it's not the it's not the the hard work. It's not the creativity. It's the ability to de develop this business model to demonstrate that I can work in Chicago uh, in a way that 
an investor in Frankfurt or investor in Singapore will understand. Yeah, and again, so the companies we are uh, listing, we are uh, giving an example. So where are the founders? Let's understand GitLab, where is the founder? In US, right? People like, where is the founder? US is almost American. He there. Then uh, I mean, yeah, others. I mean, for, uh, for example, is, there, the, the, there's one company that, that we, that Snack, again, Shapuro. Right, he, he's in US. I mean, the R&D is here. We are, we are naming the, the ex-former Ukrainians, but now we are speaking about current Ukrainian kids which are work, working and uh, doing startups here. So the only chance is for us, you and me, others, to help them here locally in Ukraine. Advice, be, be seen, whatever. Otherwise, then nobody cares. <laughs> Unless and, and I, they are I, there. They have their well, mindset. What, what, I, what, I think, what I think is happening, though, is... For example, we, we have this one case where the founders uh, are in Ukraine. Uh, they just happen because of circumstance to have a bit more international experience. Their advisors and the support people are in Germany and in, uh, in this case in Hollywood actually. Um, and they're able through their advisors and others to develop this credibility. So I, I think your point is correct. Uh, in many cases, the, the front office, the sales side, has ended up in the United States. And so you end up with a lot of founders moving to the U.S. and basing themselves there. But I don't think it's the exclusive model. And, and, and to the extent that we're able to either train people in Ukraine to think more globally and, and demonstrate their ability to market in Chicago, or to the extent that they're able to attract credible advisors, and, and that goes to whether or not the business itself is credible, uh, advisors who are in the United States or elsewhere. Um, I, I think either model will work. The, the historical model, I think you're quite correct, is the Ukrainian founders go to the States. But again, we are beginning to see Ukrainians with Ukraine-based businesses where, um, in fact, the, um, uh, the advisors, the non-founders, are supporting them out, from outside Ukraine. Yeah, yeah it will be also good if they will, will uh, train in uh, Eastern universities, um, in the U.S., yes. in Europe, in Asia, somewhere, at come, least in come university. To then they will, yeah, all open this opportunity. Uh, let, let's discuss the grants for Ukrainian startup ecosystem would be great. But if they at least have this uh, university education abroad, it helps a lot. They, they understand this ecosystem. They can build yeah. international business with Ukrainian talents, etc. Different models uh, actually work. And another interesting point, Chuck, also, so we discussed all together. But the, the international fund, they're looking for exits also. I mean, it's not social impact only. So now uh, you say it's uh, uh, who to exit in Ukraine. If you're building Ukrainian business, we don't have this ec at all, this ecosystem, who to exit. Yeah. Name me, I mean, there is no business, and there is no private equity, there is no b b b family offices which are ready to acquire or integrate the company. So it's a, it's a long tail story to discuss. Yeah, the, the, so, the, the, was, uh, the exits. The exit story is critical, uh, and, and it's not something that people talk about often in Ukraine because... Yeah, but let's talk about this. That, about that's it. an issue. So there is no exits. Yeah. If for, there, for us to reach 121 and the set to positive exits and uh, almost like 43 uh, altogether, this is something, I mean, uh, in 10 years, we cannot do this in Ukraine. So in yeah. Ukraine, it's either yeah. to build the cash cow, to be sustainable, to build the sustainable business, to change a little bit somehow mindset because we currently do not have the exit opportunities for startups or they are limited. Yes. I would say not, not have at all, but they are limited. They are limited. I, mean, I, mean, so. I know Andrew is going to try to cut us off. But yeah, we'll, we'll, I, I'm trying. You're, you're very like passionate about this discussion. I like some, no, of, your, some the, of your the exit. The exit point is critical. Let me, let me just, because because Victoria is exactly right about this. I mean, Mention about Horizon Capital, then I will let you uh, know. Well, the, the, so, so the, the exit for most Ukrainian companies has been either sales to either other investors or sales to strategic companies. There is no, there is no Ukrainian stock exchange, for example. And so to the extent that that might be an option, although increasingly it is less so because the valuations are, are at least more recently better when you're doing private deals. But to the extent you're thinking about a stock market, you know, I find myself in the odd situation where I'm talking to people in Ukraine and I say, yeah, you'll list in Poland uh, or we'll list in Luxembourg or, you know, so, which is an odd discussion to be having. So we do need to be thinking in terms of the ecosystem more generally. It's a longer tail, as, as Victoria was saying. We have to be thinking about exit strategies beyond simply sales to other investors 
or sales to strategic companies. We should be thinking as well about you know, the broader, the, the, the ability to liquefy these passive investments in Ukraine and outside Ukraine as well. Yeah, that's a very great point, and I, and I and I do believe that you know we should think about the ecosystem as as a whole, and and it's indeed a long tail. If you don't have internal market, how can you have entrepreneurs who understand the, you know, U.S. companies, etc. So if you differentiate it in B two B and B two C, it's even more. Cha- if you think about it, it's even more challenging to educate entrepreneurs who might be willing to sell to the U.S. who understand the U.S. corporations. So. It's by the end, the, the, the question in two ends, and you need entrepreneurs who have the experience being in the US, if you especially wanna sell to, the, uh, to, to corporations there. But on the other hand, it was mentioned that you can actually tackle this issue by either A, having more advisors that will open the doors for you, or B, actually hiring people in your team who will help you sell. And these people can be foreigners too. So you, we, we see examples of actually Grammarly doing very well selling to to B two B their product. We actually Kirill from uh, Preply as well. They they hire uh, some foreigners too. So there are ways to to tackle that. Uh, but indeed, it's it's a long tail. It's a it's more challenging uh, problem. Uh, in terms of exit as well, there are a few exactly financial market is not very developed as well. Uh, but at the same time, we have funds like our Horizon Capital, and we see that some of the Ukrainian venture capital funds they made exits by selling into our private equity arm. Uh, and, and we are hungry for, for deals like that. So um, if there are companies that raise Series C, D, and, and, and Plus and actually can show diversified revenues and, and global growth, um, there, are, there are opportunities to, sell, uh, to, you know, to exit to these funds as well. Um, but let's move on to, the, um, uh, to Emmanuel, who is a mentor and strategy advisor at ABRD Star Venture uh, Program. Manuel, uh, maybe you've seen some of the insights by working with entrepreneurs in Ukraine. And uh, what are your kind of uh, take on, on what are the gaps here and where would you actually help? Um, and, and where should we all uh, put our efforts to? Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the, for the question. Um, if uh, I can uh, comment about... Uh, the side of the entrepreneur for what I experienced here uh, for the past three years now in Ukraine and comparing to the, to, uh, to the same type of entrepreneur uh, in, uh, in France, in Germany or even in Switzerland. Um, I agree for what it was already said. Uh, what is missing is not uh, the technical side. Uh, for what I experienced, it's uh, very, very good here. Uh, so Ukrainian can be proud uh, about uh, this uh, component, which is a, a major one, of course. Um, adding uh, the flexibility, uh, the creativity, uh, like uh, said uh, Charles, uh, which is very good uh, to compete uh, because Ukraine is not alone uh, on the market and the creativity and flexibility uh, is a key component uh, which are clearly uh, missing in uh, Western Europe. I'm talking only about uh, uh, Europe, not US. Uh, which uh, again uh, is maybe also a, a missing part for entrepreneur uh, to address uh, more obsession about the U.S. market and much less uh, about the EU. And I think it's a big mistake. So uh, what is missing from the entrepreneur side? It's the business knowledge. Um, it's knowing what is the basic economics. Start by that. Uh, not getting confused uh, between the money coming from investor, money coming from uh, clients and uh, uh, either a grant or um, bank sometimes. And that for me, it was uh, my first biggest surprise. Um, and that brings some issues, of course, uh, in the mid or long term uh, surviving of the, of the early stage uh, company and startup in particular. So um, basic economics, marketing, strategy, uh, communication, uh, you don't address a French guy like a German, like a UK. Uh, in US, it's the same. You don't uh, talk to guys in California uh, like the same in Dallas or in New York. Uh, it's just not the same mentality. Uh, there is some codes uh, to learn. Uh, and it's not that it's um, easy to obtain. Uh, it's pretty much easy to obtain uh, this information. Uh, just need to be prepared. So here my point, uh, my biggest point, 
for what I see, it's more a lack of uh, preparation um, in meetings, uh, in uh, modeling, in, um, in many aspects, not because of uh, a form of laziness, uh, it's not the point, it's more because there is an enthusiasm, which is very good, and saying, okay, I can take the, uh, the things, uh, let's go. Yeah, Did, do you know the people who you are meeting sometimes? Uh, it's like that, it's basic. So some, di some this basic preparation about how the business is run, uh, how you handle uh, your preparation for um, meetings, uh, either with investor, uh, potential client, uh, other stakeholders, it can be uh, mentioned by uh, USF, uh, for instance, uh, preparation, yeah, I agree, it can be complicated, but sometimes complicated, it can be good. Uh, first of all, it's uh, uh, um, um, an entry uh, for competitor uh, uh, less easy. So if you can make it, uh, you are better than other in some aspect. Um, and this, uh, uh, this difficulty bring uh, possibilities uh, like the COVID. I like uh, some of uh, the posts saying that uh, we don't uh, need to see it as a threat, but as an opportunity. So difficulties, maybe uh, uh, also a biggest uh, point that uh, um, I saw many, many um, founders uh, stopping uh, their um, venture uh, just because it was too difficult. And I'm pretty much opposite. I say, embrace it. Uh, and if you can't, find a job. You are not done for being an entrepreneur uh, because you need to really embrace these difficulties. So that's my point on entrepreneur side. And I think uh, uh, Kirill, uh, Dima, and Alexander can uh, really relate uh, to that. It's not an easy journey, uh, but it's an enjoyable journey uh, if you can really embrace these difficulties. From a uh, venture, more business angel, I'm not much in contact with uh, venture capital, even I know a little about uh, Victoria uh, and David, uh, but I'm working more for business angels, scouting and uh, going to a due deal uh, for some startup here in Ukraine. Um, then we need to bring them physically. Okay, not easy today, uh, particularly since uh, last uh, Friday in Ukraine, uh, but it's possible. Um, why? Because at the end of the day, what will bring an investor and a good investor uh, in your venture uh, is the, um, the emotion created. Uh, we can have numerous uh, type of uh, uh, metrics uh, explaining uh, why a startup was successful to raise funds. Now, at the end of the day, it's the emotion you had created. So the purpose you, uh, you add on your company and how you develop that. So again, communication. Uh, for uh, investor, um, just come here. Uh, you will be uh, surprised uh, because each time there is no cases of investor coming in the past four years here. Uh, I could invite or uh, be able to, uh, to get acquainted. When they come here the first time, uh, they have very low expectation to be uh, clear but they are amazed about uh, the quality of uh, the people they are meeting, uh, the, uh, even the, the infrastructure. Um, okay, I understand some Ukrainian that uh, it can be improved, of course it can be improved, um, but uh, taking account the expectation, uh, the reality is way, way much better. So for investors listening, just book a ticket, it's not expensive. Uh, you will enjoy it three, four, five days. Uh, we can organize a learning expedition. Uh, there is many good people here. They are ready to, uh, to, uh, to take your hand and, uh, and come here and visit. And I'm sure uh, out of that, uh, you will have a business. I have an example, for instance, it was June 2017 uh, or 18. Um, it was a 20, uh, startup uh, on media from France in the agro tech uh, uh, landscape. They came here for one week and uh, they came here really um, a low expectation and thinking that uh, they, they had almost nothing to learn here. After five days, we have three joint venture. 
because they were amazed about uh, the uh, Ukrainian landscape. And, uh, and that uh, was really, really good uh, to experience that. Um, so for investor, come here, book your ticket, you will enjoy it. Yeah, thank you, Manuel. Lots of great ideas. Um, we'll move to Dominic. Um, and Dominic is the CEO of Unit City, but Dominic spent a lot of time in the US uh, and lived in Silicon Valley and, you know, seen also different ecosystems. And, you know, talking, Victoria brought up community uh, part. And uh, Dominic, you've experienced communities, vibrant communities in Silicon Valley. You've seen how people interact there, investors and entrepreneurs. And now you're heading a, um, you know, a, a place which is also aimed to build this community in Kiev as well, to some extent. Um, can you share a little bit about your insights and take on, on, on the community building and what's lacking in the ecosystem and how can we improve it? Sure, uh, absolutely. Um, so, well, I've been I've been spending 16 years in Silicon Valley, I'm building a few companies. I'm an LP in a fund, um, so I, I have quite an experience of understanding of Silicon Valley. And uh, um, I, I would say one of the things that is key to me is the power of the network. Um, to create a successful company, you need to have access to a network. Um, it's key because this is what's going to help you when you have questions. This is what is going to support you. This is how you're going to find funding. Um, and, 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 and really, to do that, you need to have a certain scale. Um, I mean, look, th there is a reason Silicon Valley exists. There is a reason um, Israel exists. There is a reason Boston exists as tech ecosystem is, is because it, there's an, a size, a critical size uh, of people doing the same things that then can help support each other, finance each other, uh, scale, grow, exit, and start from the, the very beginning again. Um, there's a journey here. We, we don't have that yet here in Ukraine, and, and I think this is something we are missing, and it takes time to build. Um, it takes pioneers. Um, people like Alex or people like, uh, I mean, the one, the one we saw uh, earlier, um, and Dima and, and people like that, who are the pioneers, who are going to create the first startup, who are going to become unicorn, who are going to exit, and who are willing to then give back. Um, I think we saw that in many countries uh, around. I mean, look at the Skype mafia. Um, if I think about the region, right? I mean, those people have been able to grow their company. Um, and then it's, it's, it's kind of coming back in many, many ways. So I think creating an ecosystem is absolutely key um, to create something that is going to be successful. I mean, I, I agree with everything else that has been said before, but I think this is really a, an absolutely key component. And I think this is what we're trying to do with Unit City, is to create something that is um, that has a critical size um, to, to support that ecosystem. Um, I mean, once again, there's no other reason for Silicon Valley to exist. It, it's, it's not, when you think about it, it's not even a rational place. Uh, it's, it's expensive, it's far, uh, it's, uh, it's, you know what I mean? I mean, today an entrepreneur telling me, oh, I'm gonna go to Silicon Valley, I'm saying, are you sure? It's, it's gonna cost you a lot and the barrier to entry is high. Um, so, so I think this is the first component. Another component that is key, and that has been mentioned several times, is education. Um, I think the role of what Charles is doing, David is doing, um, we are trying to do in, in Unit City is, is not only tech education, but also business education. Uh, we really need that business education. I think this is something that is lacking in Ukraine. Um, um, Victoria mentioned, I think, and I 200% agree with that, uh, a lack of marketing skills, a lack of sales skills. Um, I think, I think it's, it's absolutely key and we need to teach that. We started Unit School of Business to do that, but, but, but we're very small. I also think Victoria mentioned something that is very interesting is you need to do that at a very young age. 
I mean, look, my, my son is seven years old. Uh, when he was uh, at school in California, in San Francisco, he learned at three years old how to pitch, right? Because that's what kids do uh, at school. They learn how to pitch. Um, and, and I think this is, this is something we need, we need to teach. In, in a world where communication is absolutely key, you need to learn how to communicate. You need to learn how to sell yourself. You need to learn how to promote yourself. You need to learn um, and how to do those things. And I think, I think, I think we desperately need this um, in Ukraine. Um, so, so that's that's kind of my my my, my takeaway. I think um, Ukraine has a, as a as a number of extremely good advantage and a, and, and a number of extremely strong disadvantage. Uh, one of them is the storytelling. Um, when you talk about Ukraine uh, to anybody in California, to anybody in Paris, people are thinking, what, are you crazy, Ukraine? Um, and, and you know, it's, it's, so, and this is something that we need to work on because we cannot ask each and every entrepreneur to go pitch Ukraine uh, before they start pitching their company. And, and I hear that way too often. They start pitching Ukraine before they start pitching their company. Um, when, when you see a French entrepreneur uh, moving to Silicon Valley or trying to pitch for an, a VC in, uh, investment in Silicon Valley, he doesn't speak, speak, uh, pitch France. He, he pitches his company. Um, but today we see, we see that too much. So we need, we need all of us to, to be united and, 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 and to change that storytelling. Now there is also one thing that is on the very positive side, and, and, and I actually really see that during this crisis that we're facing. Um, this is a country where people are extremely resilient, extremely resilient. Um, you know, when, this started, when the crisis started, I told my, my boss, Vasil Kmeniski, say, oh my God, a crisis. And he was like, yeah, we're used to that. Every, every three to five years, we have a crisis here. We're ready for it. Let, let's go, let's embrace it. Let's, and, and I think, and I view this as something that extremely key because I think that's one of the main quality of an entrepreneur. It's someone who is able to face crisis. Um, and, and, and I think this is, this is something we need to learn from. I think this is something we should build on. Um, I think we're going to see an amazing generation of entrepreneurs because I think being an entrepreneur is becoming cool in Ukraine. I don't think that was the case a few years ago, but I think it's becoming cool. Um, and I always tell that story. When I, when, I, when I grew up in France, when I was 23, 25, um, I told my parents I want to create a company and my parents were like, are you crazy? go to consulting and go to banking. And that's what you were supposed to do. Um, and that's what I did. And then I had to live to the US to create my company. I think we have to create that environment where creating a company is also something that is cool, that is interesting, that, is, that has a future. Um, and, and I believe people like Alexander or, or, or Dima are, are also the picture of that new generation um, of, of entrepreneur. And, and, and we need that. And we will see more entrepreneurs um, coming after them because they are the role model uh, of, of the new Ukraine or, or the next Ukraine, of what Ukraine is, is going to become. Um, and I think it's strong. Um, and then last thing, you know, uh, I just come back from San Francisco. I, I did a month in San Francisco and I saw something I've never seen before. I saw a ghost town. Um, and I don't think it's just because of the COVID. I think it was kind of like a little bit here before already. Uh, it was burgeoning. Um, and, and I saw a ghost town because up to a point, the value of a network is, is not equivalent to what you have to pay to access this network. The, the, the price of accessing the, the, the ecosystem of Silicon Valley is becoming too high. Um, I think we have, uh, we have a play. Uh, we, have, we, we have something to play here. Um, and I think we should, and I think we should push it as much as we can. So, I mean, that's, those are my, my, few, my few takeaways from this. Um, I'm, 
um, and, uh, and, and also what was cool is to hear how passionate we all are about, uh, about this country and about the potential of this country. And I think that is something that always fascinates me each time I, I meet people from Ukraine working in the tech industry, we're all super passionate about it. We, we love it. We see um, how strong and powerful uh, it can be. So go Ukraine, go. <laughs> wow, that was inspiring, Dominic. Thank you so much for your inspiration and ideas. Uh, well, we have a little bit of time left, but we still have Emma, um, Emmanuel, um, who's Chief Innovation Officer at DTAC and board member at UVCA. And, you know, as a part of the ecosystem, demand is very important and companies create this demand. And Emmanuel represents uh, one of the biggest companies in Ukraine. And just wondering, you know, Emmanuel, what uh, you, you also, you know, the company has done some initiatives in supporting the tech ecosystem as well. Could you share a little bit how you develop um, the tech ecosystem here? What are your thoughts about it? How you create the demand for startup products and, and companies? Yeah, thanks a lot, Andre. Uh, let's say my name is Emmanuel. Emmanuel is our friend <laughs> from French. I am from Italy. <laughs> So, Emanuele, let's say a couple of words uh, <laughs> regarding uh, DTEC. Uh, DTEC is the largest the private investor in the energy sector in Ukraine. We're talking about uh, oil and gas, uh, machinery building, coal extraction, uh, logistic, thermal generation, uh, renewables, uh, YASNO, that's our interface uh, towards uh, our customers, then the trading uh, grids. 200 kilometer grids all around Ukraine. We're talking about almost uh, 73,000 employees. So DTEC is the typical utility company. Now, one question uh, uh, to all of you. Are utility companies still needed in 10, 8, let's say 5, or somebody is telling also 2 years? Taking into account what's going on, I mean, in the world, that, that the pace of change uh, so we understood that uh, we can develop uh, our research and development uh, center, that is everything inside, or better, we have embraced uh, what is called the open innovation approach. That is an approach I thought that Chesbrook a few years ago. Uh, what does it mean? That within our company, we had a lot of very talented people, but uh, outside our company, it is possible to find uh, other talented people. So uh, uh, makes no sense to leverage only on internal, but uh, it's faster and more uh, efficient uh, involve external people. So we have created, uh, we are still in the process of creating this uh, innovation ecosystem where we have uh, our company on the left side in the middle we have innovation detect and on the left side we have an interconnection between startups between customers with the, between suppliers then within funds universities and why not also competitors so in which way do we work first point if you need to involve external people you need to be open so you need to get in touch with the business. So we as Innovation in Tech are uh, in touch with our business. We create our challenges and those challenges that basically are in which way uh, external ecosystem can support the tech are public. So if you go into, if you browse our uh, uh, web um, the site, the tech, you go into innovation. If you push innovation, you see our challenges. Somebody at the beginning was telling, wow, but if we publish our challenge, basically it's our strategy. So everybody can understand and maybe copy our strategy. Uh, our uh, approach is, okay, better we share our strategies with everybody, allowing everybody to uh, provide their solution, then to find another, I don't know, Airbnb, Uber, or uh, Elon Musk is launching a rocket. I mean, disruptive, I mean, uh, the typical, how to say, uh, corporate uh, approach. So as soon as uh, we get uh, support from those, or proposal from those six uh, different, uh, let's say, stakeholders, we process internally. Uh, 
sometimes we use a creative approach and I thank you very much Charles since you know uh, creativity is something that uh, uh, sometimes we forget but it is one of the three how to say factors that are multiplying are producing innovation innovation is creativity multiplied by appeal multiplied by um, um, how to say multiply by uh, development so you cannot have innovation without creativity otherwise it's, i'll say it's, 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 it's a boring you cannot have innovation without appeal you can have innovation without development otherwise it's only an idea so it's not coming to uh, a, a real business taking into account that uh, Innovation Detect uh, exists since uh, two years. At the beginning, two years ago, we were, I mean, like yes. So we did not uh, so much experience. So we rely on, uh, um, to say, Unit City to have the first accelerator. And I have to say that uh, it was the first time in Ukraine we got at the beginning of our hopper 180 startups. We came at the end uh, with almost 10 startups. And it's interesting, like, uh, um, I mean, the tech is not interested in buying startups. So most of the time uh, we appear on a public, uh, how to say, arena, startups are scared since I think that the tech is acquiring all the stakes. We are not interested in buying startups. We are interested in bringing within our company their technology. So what does it mean? As soon as the technology is ready, is, you know, you could be approached by a startup with a technology that is not still ready. So we run a pilot project. As soon as the technology is ready, I mean, we sign a business with, uh, with the startup. Uh, an example, the first startup that uh, approached us was an Ukrainian startup called Everscan. So they approached us with this proposal uh, we are skilled in uh, running drones and we have a good software that is uh, um, calculating the, the volume of the buildings. So we run a creativity section uh, thanks to Lego Serious Play and uh, we have decided, okay, uh, we propose it. Okay, we are interested in this technology not to calculate the volume of buildings but to calculate the volume of our coal warehouses that we have in our power plants. So before uh, signing a contract with this uh, startup, uh, basically we have our people that were you know, climbing, uh, measuring, uh, you know, hand way. Uh, and now thanks to uh, drones, we have uh, um, a drone that is flying over our coal warehouse in 20 minutes. I mean, you can have a 3D, um, um, how to say, uh, a 3D session. And at the end, you get right away the volume of the coal. Uh, let me also say that sometimes we are approached by startups that they have some kind of uh, uh, not uh, ready idea. So the readiness level is five, six. But the proposal is interesting. So when we run pilot project with them, we uh, assign uh, people from our company, basically they are innovation focal point or there are experts from the business that are working with the startup in order to raise the level of uh, uh, the proposal and to come to some kind of uh, uh, good value. Let me also add that uh, when we sign a contract with the startup and we have signed it already a while uh, since now, uh, the startup is not our startup. I mean, uh, as uh, Dominique was, was telling right, we are here interested, of course, to introduce in our company uh, innovating proposals, but most important uh, to uh, raise the innovation ecosystem of Ukraine. So what does it mean if a startup has, signed, has, has developed with us an interesting product and has signed with us, then the startup is able to sign with, I mean, other uh, corporates or other clients. And this is something that it's, it has already happened. Okay, we could say, I mean, we have spent time, we have spent also money, since, you know, sometimes pilot project, I mean, you need to put money on the table to develop. And then somebody other is taking this uh, solution. Uh, that's okay. I mean, this is a part of the game. Of course, uh, we are first interested to introduce those proposals into our business, but we are more interested than the startup will get additional money from another company. Then 
to close the loop uh, between uh, big corporates, uh, startups, uh, and funds. Uh, again, the tech does not buy startups, but the tech is more than interested in uh, having a relationship with funds, with accelerator, to get uh, from them proposals. And then uh, if uh, we are interested and we move forward with the startup, we are in touch with funds, accelerator, and so on and so forth, uh, they can put money on the startup since they will know <laughs> that a corporate then uh, will sign a contract. So basically additional in income for uh, the startup. This is basically the way we work. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you for outlining the, um, the structure, how you work and what are you looking for. We have a little bit of time left for one or two questions and we covered a lot of what been asked in the Q&A. Um, but some question that is important but not been really addressed might be a little bit, uh, you know, not as exciting but very important about the legal issues uh, of startups here. And the question is about, um, I, I think, I, you know, it, I, I would address it to Chuck as he can, he's a you know, law professor plus has had a chance to observe both ecosystem and has expertise in, uh, you know, in both. So I will address it to Chuck. Um, let sure. me see. Um, so the question, the, the question goes yeah, could, to... Could, so the question is, is going uh, to you and it sounds like, could you please evaluate the legal environment for startups in Ukraine from, from one to 10? and maybe give some comments if it's possible in comparison to other countries you're working with, maybe some useful expertise from other countries to implement in Ukraine. Sure. Um, so I, I, would, I, I would separate, it, it, you're asking a law professor, you have to realize, I can go on for about an hour, I won't. Uh, I'll, do it, I'll do it in 60 seconds. Um, you have to separate the black letter law from the law in practice. And you have to separate that from what investors prefer. So the black letter law in Ukraine is actually not that bad. If you read the statutes, uh, for example, on intellectual property rights or, or the creation of companies and, and uh, you know, the, the corporate law, uh, it looks quite familiar to someone who is uh, comfortable with laws in Western Europe and the United States. And not surprisingly, many of these laws are, are taken from uh, uh, examples from outside Ukraine. The problem is the enforcement and the practice. Uh, and so notwithstanding, for example, the intellectual property laws on paper looking quite strong, uh, in practice, they're not well respected internationally. Uh, and that's because things like patents and other types of protections in Ukraine uh, really in practice don't follow global standards. Um, likewise with corporate organizations, uh, you know, on paper, uh, there are things like fiduciary duties and obligations of directors and protections for shareholders. And they look quite similar to what you would see in the United States. In practice, they're just not enforced. Um, and so if I were to view it, you know, in terms of the black letter, I'd give it a better than a five, maybe a six or a seven. Um, if I view it in terms of enforcement and, and practical application, it's maybe a three or four. Now, on top of this, there's also the absence of what I would think of as legal infrastructure that directly is looking to support startups. For example, uh, one sees tax breaks in the United States in, 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 in uh, Silicon Valley historically, more recently here in New York, uh, there are tax benefits. Uh, there are also special regulations to make it easier for startups to actually uh, create and form and access capital. You don't see that in Ukraine. So the infrastructure is there, it's getting better. I mean, I don't wanna overlook the fact that in the last five years, there have been some real improvements, uh, but there's a really a need to, to enhance enforcement. And beyond that, there's a need to create a legal infrastructure to affirmatively support investors, to aff affirmatively support uh, the creation and the growth of, of startups. And that, that second piece really hasn't come to Ukraine in addition to, um, in addition to structuring. Now, I, I should mention, Right? These are things that experienced lawyers can work around. There's no reason why you can't have a startup in Ukraine that is a Ukraine operation with Ukraine founders and working in Ukraine and yet have the legal entity in Germany or the United States or Canada. Uh, and so you can bifurcate some of these issues. Let me be very clear. I'm not advocating, I would never advocate the export of businesses 
But in terms of just legal issues and enhancing legal certainty, creative lawyers can work around not all the issues, but many of the issues in order to attract foreign investment in a way, or for that matter, Ukrainian investment, in a way that will give them the sorts of assurances they might get uh, if they were outside Ukraine. Okay, so that's my two minute version. If you want the other 58 minutes, let me know, I'm happy to do it. No, that, that, was, that was great. Um, I, you know, a little bit further, I would like to know about financial regulation and how can you have more international financial transactions uh, from Ukraine and whether any legislation has been, you know, progress in that direction. That's something that I would love to hear more insights. If you have a few comments on that, I would, I would appreciate that. Yeah, so, so there are real issues about getting, so, so the legislation for foreign investment to come into Ukraine uh, has, you know, moved towards permitting this to happen. In practice, I'm finding it quite difficult. Uh, I've had investors that are trying to move, for example, I had one investor in Boston, wanted to uh, invest $100,000 into Ukraine, got blocked by the banks. Uh, and that's because even though the legislation permitted it, there was no reason why this couldn't happen. Uh, and this was a Ukrainian entity, again, with a Boston-based investor, uh, the banks uh, were not yet set up in a way to um, uh, take this money in. It raised all sorts of red flags uh, as money laundering or something, but it wasn't an activity that they were set up to do. So we ended up having to create an entity in Germany, of all places, in order to take this funding. Um, so you are still, so again, this is what I say, the, the law is there to actually permit these types of investments. Uh, there are ways in which you can enhance them, tax changes, changes in the way in which corporate law operates. Uh, but in practice, we're finding uh, when we try to bring this money into Ukraine, uh, it's quite, quite difficult to do it because of the way banks continue to be set up. Perfect. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, so we have a few minutes left. So I, I'll take this few minutes to maybe wrap up. And maybe if somebody has final comments, feel free to to, to jump in. Um, so, you know, lots have been uh, covered today during the talk. We had a great comments from people from venture capital, entrepreneurs, accelerators, companies, uh, and had great insights. Uh, overall, there was, uh, you know, to sum up, we had some pre-COVID realities where there was, you know, prevalent if you're a Ukrainian entrepreneur, it was harder to raise money if you're in the US and, and if you don't have an international company, but it seems it might be changing with, um, uh, with post-COVID and kind of venture capital investors ready to uh, connect with other people around the world. Um, the perception of Ukrainian entrepreneurs changed as well. We might, be, uh, we might be a bit stronger selling the technical side of the products and technical products. We have great engineers, but might be working a little bit more on improving business side of, of things and uh, you know, uh, ability to sell products to different customers around the globe. We, had, we have internal limited internal market. And that's why we need to boost our ability to sell these products abroad as well. Uh, this can be done by, you know, attracting, you know, foreign advisors, uh, foreign people for, with, with sales expertise from other countries, uh, et, et cetera. Uh, lots has, uh, very important is despite the COVID or uh, the, the ability to build the network because once now, at least temporarily, we cannot really travel a lot. So we cannot really, uh, you know, build the, uh, the network uh, offline. So we need to to think about how can we actually move and build an a internal uh, network here in Ukraine among entrepreneurs who are building something you can share their expertise and B get other people from the other countries engaged in, 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 um, you know, in the ecosystem here, either by, you know, advising or, or joining the startup. So network is important and community building the community uh, of both uh, angel investors, entrepreneurs and, and advisor are very important education, um, uh, is something that has been mentioned and something that we need to tackle in, 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 in this regard. Um, so I, I'm surprised that funding wasn't really uh, much emphasized, but uh, it seems like uh, indeed, I mean, there are entrepreneurs who are already uh, building their companies, but there are potentially some entrepreneurs who might be uh, joining and, and this early funding and later funding can help them to, to kind of step in into this entrepreneurship game. That's something that is uh, very important, but the funding must be also kind of smart funding from people who actually can bring value to the to the companies and to the entrepreneurs. That's something that uh, that is very important and something that has been mentioned. 
Uh, overall, it's been very uh, pleasant discussion, lots of great insights, uh, something that we will put down and uh, Vadim might, uh, you know, we've recorded it live, so you're uh, willing to, to, to listen it again uh, afterwards and take notes. Uh, otherwise, it was a pleasure seeing you all in this discussion, and I, I hope we'll bring this also to the next level and, 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 and involve more people and, 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 you know, kind of develop the community of entrepreneurs, venture capitalists here. And, and bring Ukrainian venture capital system to the next level. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Thank you, guys. Yeah, oh. doing a great job. Yeah, let's promote thank Ukraine you. globally. <laughs> yes. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jack, Vadim, David, Paula. Thank you. Bye-bye. Dominic, Emmanuel.